Hi, everybody. Thanks for <laughs> thanks for bearing with us a few minutes. We had some uh, technical problems to sort out. Thank you so much for being patient. Uh, welcome to our 13th Fire Tree Family and Community Webinar. Uh, so our topic for today is overdose, Narcan, and harm reduction techniques. And uh, our presenter today is Kyle Miller. Kyle is the clinical supervisor uh, for our Conewago Pottsville site. So if this, if you've joined us a couple times, this is uh, maybe a little bit different. Um, so we're very excited. And I just wanted to do a little housekeeping. So we do have our Q&A box uh, at the bottom of your screen. So if you have any questions as things are, as we're progressing through the slideshow, you can go ahead and enter them there. And we'll circle back at the end and answer anything that might be remaining or give you a few seconds to ask any questions. And then there are some helpful links at the bottom of the uh, some of the slides, including our uh, YouTube archive with our past webinars that you can take a look at, um, and our Fire Tree website and a few others. So uh, take a look there if you'd like. Um, and we can go ahead and get started. Thanks for the introduction, Amber. I appreciate it. As you guys can see, the topic's going to be overdose, Narcan, and harm reduction techniques. I'm obviously Kyle Miller. I'm the clinical supervisor here at our Pottsville location. And uh, we can get started with the agenda. Amber's going to be flipping through my slides. <laughs> that was part of the technical difficulties, which had nothing to do with me. Totally not my fault. Um, in all seriousness, though, guys, uh, I do want to preface this month's webinar by saying that we will be discussing some topics that can be very triggering. So if you know someone lost to overdose or are someone struggling with repeated overdose and don't think that emotionally this is going to be beneficial for you or if it will maybe negatively affect your mental health, this will be posted on our YouTube. So you could always come back at a later date. Um, <clears throat> but without further ado, the agenda for this webinar, we're going to talk about International Overdose Awareness Day. We're going to discuss what overdose is and how it occurs. We're going to look at the leading causes and contributors to overdose today, stemming overdose through the use of Narcan, how and when to use Narcan, what harm reduction is, and some harm reduction practices. Slide. Overdose Awareness Day was started by a woman named Sally Finn a little over 20 years ago in Australia, actually, something that I didn't know until I did some research on this. And she started this day to really remember those in her community lost to overdose. Some of the goals of International Overdose Awareness Day that it sets out to achieve are educating community members about overdose and overdose prevention, to send a strong message to those currently using that they have value and that they are loved, to stimulate discussion about overdose prevention and drug policy, provide basic information on available support services of all levels, detoxes, inpatients, halfway houses, nonprofits, um, et cetera. And lastly, to prevent and reduce drug-related harm by supporting evidence-based policies like harm reduction, something that we're gonna talk about a little later today. But one of the main purposes of International Overdose Awareness Day, and the main topic of last month's webinar actually, is to reduce the stigma surrounding substance use disorder and surrounding overdose. Stigma directly leads to overdose by preventing individuals from entering treatment, receiving proper resources, and having the necessary infrastructure needed to help addicts get from the street to treatment and into recovery. Throughout the entire 20th century, those struggling with substance use disorder, they've been punished, starting with the Harrison Anti-Narcotic Act in 1914, to labeling drugs America's public enemy, enemy, and finally starting the war on drugs in the 1970s. Thanks to Sally Finn starting International Overdose Awareness Day, it's now gone on to be celebrated in over 40 countries. And I'm confident in saying today that it's played a major role in reducing stigma 
and increasing exposure for outreach and support. So for anyone who wants to get involved in their community, you could go right over to overdoseday.com. It's at the bottom of the slide. They have a calendar there with events in all areas around the US and even the world. They host memorials, candle lights, days of remembrance, celebrations of life and more. I was personally able to go to Harrisburg this year actually for International Overdose Awareness Day at our Capitol. I had the opportunity to watch those who've lost someone to overdose come together and share stories in an environment free of judgment and stigma. So if you know someone or are someone affected by overdose, I highly encourage checking out that website and getting involved in your community. So depending on your level of experience or involvement with substance use, you may not know what overdose is or what it means. An overdose occurs when the amount of drug, substance, or medicine is taken that surpasses one's tolerance threshold, resulting in serious injury, permanent injury, or death. Opioid overdose is currently the most common and what the main focus of this webinar will be on. However, other forms of overdose obviously do happen and we will touch on those. It's very important to note that not all overdoses are fatal. You may hear this in passing or in conversation with someone struggling with substance use disorder. If someone references an overdose, it does not mean that person has passed away. But a potential overdose should always be treated as life-threatening. 911 should always be called if the person displays any of the following signs or symptoms. Their face is extremely pale or they even feel clammy. Their body goes limp. They turn blue or purple. They start vomiting or making weird noises. They can't be awakened or are unable to speak. And their breathing slows or even stops. Another important distinction to make is that when someone is quote unquote unable to be awakened, this can be in all sorts of unconventional contexts. A good indicator of a potential risk factor for overdose is when someone is nodded out. This means their chin is usually resting at the top of their chest. This can be in the seat of a car, on the couch, or they could even be standing up. So the inability to wake, to not be able to be woken up doesn't typically take place in someone's bed after a long night's sleep. <clears throat> Opioid overdose is not the only type of overdose, obviously. Overdose can and does occur with other substances, but first, it's important to understand a little bit about the brain. Your body uses chemicals called neurotransmitters to send messages from the brain to the rest of the body to instruct it to do all sorts of normal and not so normal functions. Waving your hand or walking or even pumping the blood throughout your body are all functions that neurotransmitters are in charge of controlling. Overdose can look very different depending on the type of substance that is taken and the amount that it's taken in. But neurotransmitters contribute in some way to all overdoses despite the causing substance. In the case of a stimulant overdose, Methamphetamine and cocaine put someone at the highest risk. This can take place after just one use or over a period of time. Stimulant overdose typically results in heart attack, stroke, or liver toxicity. Liver toxicity would be an example of overdose resulting from long-term use. It should also be noted that methamphetamine overdose deaths nearly tripled from 2015 to 2019. This is in part due to opioids being either unknowingly added or taken at the same time. Benzodiazepine overdose resulting in death is very uncommon. However, according to the CDC, it's the fifth highest contributor of overdose resulting in death yearly. This is mostly due to benzos being mixed with other respiratory depressions like alcohol or opioids. An isolated benzodiazepine overdose so an overdose on just benzos, nothing else mixed in, includes central nervous system depression with slightly low vital signs and slowed breathing. For severe cases, individuals should be taken to the hospital and can be put on a respirator. But again, this is very uncommon. Opioid overdose is currently the leading cause of overdose resulting in death in the US. 
like benzos, it's the central nervous system depressant. It slows the respiratory system down so much that it can be fatal. Neurotransmitters in the brain are prevented from sending necessary messages to continue breathing. If uninterrupted, breathing can stop completely. Alcohol is another one that I wanna mention that's not listed on the slide. It's another depressant that can lead to overdose, usually from alcohol poisoning, and blacking out is actually considered to be an overdose as well. Dehydration due to excess alcohol consumption can lead to unconsciousness. This is usually the riskiest aspect of alcohol overdose. It can lead to choking hazards or even being exposed to other environmental risk factors like freezing temperatures. According to the American Addiction Center, blood alcohol concentrations between 0 0.60 and 0 0.80 are fatal. This, of course, varies by individuals and individual factors. Slide. So what is the catalyst for the increase in overdose recently? The opioid epidemic is thought to be the leading cause. The opioid epidemic can be traced back to 1995 when OxyContin was created and strategically marketed as a safe and non-addictive pain relief medication. According to the National Institute of Health, 5,402 people died from prescription opioids and heroin overdose in 1999 in the U.S. With creation of harmful synthetic opioids like fentanyl, the number of deaths since then have multiplied by 20. Fentanyl is a synthetic opioid that was originally used in the medical field as a painkiller for patients undergoing serious surgery or in late stage cancer. However, fentanyl has many versions and analogs that are out there with some being a hundred times stronger than medical grade fentanyl. This, had led, this has led to a rapid increase in overdose deaths. According to the CDC, 33,000 people died from overdose in 2015. As of our most recent statistic, this figure is now at 107,000. That's the highest it's ever been. So in about six years, overdose has tripled. The CDC reports that 70% of these overdoses are opioid related. Most cases of fentanyl related overdose are linked to illegally made fentanyl, but it gets really confusing and hard to keep up with the status quo. There's so many different forms and combinations, and it really seems like there's a different version that comes out every month. A call to action to decrease the rapid, uh, the rapid spread of illicit opioids and provide aid and support for those currently struggling is paramount right now. The contribution of fentanyl to the rapid increase of overdose deaths within the U.S. cannot go unnoticed. Fentanyl is considered 50 times stronger than heroin and 100 times stronger than morphine. As stated previously, fentanyl has many analogs. Its cell structure can easily be alerted, altered in many different ways to reduce or increase its potency. Carfentanil is one of those analogs, or otherwise known as carfentanil. It is inexpensive to make and is considered 50 times stronger than heroin, 100 times stronger than fentanyl, and 10,000 times stronger than morphine. Carfentanil is an extremely potent fentanyl analog, which is used in veterinarian medicine to sedate large animals like elephants and rhinos. It's typically administered by a tranquilizer dart for these animals, and it was never meant for human consumption. But just a disclaimer, carfentanil is not being flooded into your local community by your local vet. Um, China remains the primary source of the chemicals needed to make it, which are then processed and manufactured into synthetic opioids by Mexican drug cartels and I believe snuck into the United States. Um, so protect your local vet, don't, don't go after them. So these different fentanyl analogs are found being mixed into counterfeit prescription medications commonly used by those struggling with substance use disorder. Xanax and Percocet are among the top prescription meds that are illegally tampered with. Drug dealers are using pill presses to manufacture replica Percocet and Xanax by using fentanyl to substitute the highly sought after ingredients found in these medications. It's also becoming increasingly common to find fentanyl mixed with cocaine and methamphetamines 
to increase addictive potential and turn a profit. Nefarious efforts such as these continue to cause thousands of overdose deaths each year, affecting innocent families and communities. Harm from these fentanyl analogs also extends to our first responders. Firefighters, EMTs, and even police officers now carry Narcan for not only victims, but one another. Just being exposed to fentanyl by breathing it in or getting it on your skin can be fatal. So at the top in gray, uh, we see opioid involved overdose deaths peaking at around 80,000 individuals in 2021. Directly below that in yellow, we see psychostimulants like methamphetamine involved overdose deaths peaking at 32,000 individuals as of 2021. Historically, amphetamine overdose hasn't been very common. It just, you don't see it, it doesn't really happen. As you can see in this chart, Amphetamine overdoses prior to 2015 have been pretty marginal. It isn't until we see synthetic opioids like fentanyl start to come about that we see an increase in amphetamine overdose deaths. I think this speaks volumes about the direct cause of overdose right now in America and makes things very clear. It is synthetic opioids that are perpetuating this slide. So now that we know what overdose is and what's causing it, we're gonna talk about how to prevent it. Narcan is a brand name for naloxone. You may hear these terms used interchangeably um, in common practice, and even by me, I might be using them interchangeably. Naloxone is considered an opioid antagonist. This means that it attaches to the opioid receptor and reverses the effects of any opiates that are currently bound to the MU opioid receptor. So simply put, they reverse the uh, they reverse the effects of opioids on the body. When someone is experiencing an overdose, breathing becomes shallow and heart rate slows. Narcan allows the body to begin breathing at a normal rate and regain consciousness. It's important to remember that overdose may happen hours after taking an opioid. If you are or know someone who uses, it's important to remain with them for the duration after use. Narcan can be administered by anyone. There are little risks associated with it, and it is not a controlled substance. It's non-addictive, and it has no street value. Narcan will not reverse the onset of non-opioids, though, meaning it will not reverse negative effects brought on by benzos, stimulants, or alcohol. Narcan has very little dangers. Some do report mild allergies to it, and there are concerned about, concerns about administering it to those that are pregnant. It should be done in small doses if necessary, but should always be done under the supervision of a doctor. Next slide. The US Food and Drug Administration approved Narcan as an over-the-counter drug in just March of this year, actually. This is something that's very new. This just recently happened. So Narcan will be available at stores like Walmart, CVS, Rite Aid, and Walgreens. In fact, I was just in CVS and I saw it um, right behind the register. It hit shelves at about $45 a carton, and each carton has two doses, which I think is a little expensive. Um, but if you have private insurance, though, you can get it for around $50, depending on your insurance carrier. And if you have medical assistance or Medicaid, the copay is next to nothing. It's usually free or maybe a dollar. It's also important to keep in mind that using Narcan is an evidence-based model and it does save lives. There seems to be some controversy that some believe um, the wide availability of this might encourage or even increase use, which is totally false. It couldn't be further from the truth. According to the NIH, Narcan availability is about preventing death and it's part of the harm reduction model. Slide. So I will preface this slide by saying that I'm not a licensed or certified Narcan trainer. This is strictly for educational purposes, but nonetheless, this is still very helpful if um, you should ever be caught in the situation where you do need to use it. Um, if you would like to become Narcan trained though, you can go right over to cdc.gov. They have a free um, online webinar on their website or getnaloxonenow.com. I have a few websites linked in this slide if you ever want to come back. Um, they're both free, they're open to anyone, and they're very easy to access. 
So naloxone can be administered in three different ways. Intranasal, which is the most common and just like the one that you see in the picture on the slide. There's also an auto injector, almost like an EpiPen, where naloxone is preloaded. And lastly, by injection via a syringe. I will say that the only intranasal spray is the only one available for over-the-counter purchase and typically the only one that you or I would ever come across um, as a non-healthcare worker. Um, next. So on this slide, we're actually going to walk through the step-by-step -step on how to administer Narcan. Uh, the first step, obviously, is to see if the person is okay, shout their name, um, try to get them to come to. If they are unresponsive, um, you could try rubbing their chest or shaking their shoulders aggressively. Um, after that, if they're not coming to, you check for signs of overdose, as referenced earlier. Is their face pale or clammy? Is their body limp? Are they turning purple or blue? Um, are there any signs of vomiting or weird noises? It has their breathing become shallowed? If you notice any of those things, the second step would be to obviously administer the Narcan. And the first thing you want to do is lay the person on their back if you're going to administer it. With the Narcan in your hand, you start by putting your index finger and your middle finger on either side of the nozzle with your thumb on the plunger. You gently insert the nozzle into either nostril, doesn't matter which nostril, um, until you feel the bottom of the person's nose resting on your index or your middle finger. It's helpful to guide the individual's head back while providing support also under the neck while administering this. The third step is uh, once you administer the Narcan to immediately call 911, whether the person comes to or not, and then put that person in the recovery position. Uh, on the third step on this slide, you see the person laying actually in the recovery position. So uh, the individual, you place their hand under their head and their knee to a 90 degree angle. You put the knee at a 90 degree angle to prevent them from rolling over and potentially hurting themselves. And obviously you put their hand under their head to provide some support so it's not laying on the ground. Um, very importantly, uh, if the person does not respond after two to three minutes, another dose can be administered. Similarly, Narcan only lasts about 30 to 90 minutes. It is possible that the person that the person can stop breathing again, depending on how much opioids have been built up in their system. Um, at this time, obviously, you administer another dose if they stop breathing after 30 or 90 minutes. Um, and after you administer Narcan, uh, it's important to understand a little bit about opioid withdrawal and, and how that works. Opioid withdrawal typically comes on shortly after dosage, usually within a few hours, but it depends on the person. Withdrawal symptoms are a wide range of flu-like symptoms. These symptoms get worse as time goes on. So day one of withdrawal is just not as severe as day seven, for example. When Narcan is administered, the effects of opioids are reversed. In real life, this results in rapid onset of withdrawal symptoms. So instead of gradual increase in symptoms over the course of hours and days with an increase in severity, it goes from zero to 100. Um, so the individual receiving Narcan will usually come to with extreme irritation, agitation, and anger at times. So just beware. Next slide. So we're gonna finish up with harm reduction. Um, there's just so much to be said about harm reduction. Really, it's a philosophy that's set out to change the status quo of how we currently treat users by reducing negative consequences and promoting choice to live healthy, purpose-filled lives. Harm reduction is meant to replace the old or current model that relies heavily on punishment, conse consequences, and cutting people off. And I can't help but think of the reality TV show Intervention. Intervention is the exact opposite of harm reduction. Instead of bringing a family together uh, with a loved one who's struggling with substance use disorder, intervention promotes cutting that person off if the ultimatum is not met. And I'm here today to tell you that that does not work. The only thing that does is give the person one more reason to continue using. So please don't watch the show Intervention, although it's entertaining. 
Okay, we're going to move on to the next slide. Harm reduction practices. Uh, again, this is just scratching the surface of what harm reduction really is about. We could probably do a whole webinar on it, um, but it should be noted that all of these practices are evidence-based. They are grounded in hard research and they do work. So uh, syringe services are one of the most popular practices in harm reduction approach. Places like San Francisco, New York, Vegas, Philadelphia, they've all implemented vending machines to distribute clean needles for free. And these vending machines also act as a disposal spot for used syringes. Overdose education and naloxone distribution is part of a harm reduction approach with emphasis on wide accessibility and training on exactly how and when to use it. Some of the harm reducing reduction vending machines actually distribute naloxone as well. They distribute a lot of different things actually. Uh, it really just depends on, on what state you're in. Fentanyl testing strips are important for pushing back against synthetic opioids like fentanyl being unknowingly added to other substances like prescription painkillers, marijuana, methamphetamine, and cocaine. It gives users the chance to at least test the substance before using it. Day centers and health hubs are starting to pop up all over the place, helping to prevent and reduce HIV and hepatitis transmission. Day centers are helpful to those lacking integration into their community. They offer CRS, resume building, and even have festival, festive gatherings on holidays. New Roots is actually a day center in my area. They help link individuals to local meetings. They have a computer lab. They'll help you get a job. Um, they're really helpful. We actually link a lot of clients to them. Access to safe and secure housing is part of the harm reduction approach as well. Actually, here at FireTree, we link a lot of people to the centers of excellence. Um, there's about 45 centers of excellence in the state of Pennsylvania. Um, they really treat the whole person, right? They help with any physical needs they have. They help with mental health. Um, they have case managers there that <clears throat> will assist with housing. They have MAT services there. Um, they're really a one-stop shop. Um, I should mention though that centers of excellence are only offered to those struggling with opiate use disorder. So just keep that in mind. Um, public health programs as alternatives to arrest and justice system involvement is a major correction to how we've been handling things in the past. This is another philosophy we believe here at FireTree. We often work with programs on the county and state level that allows inmates to opt for treatment in lieu of jail time. Uh, the last three practices listed are all about MAT services and making them more readily available. Uh, Ophelia is actually a notable online resource that I've used with a lot of my clients in the past. It's fairly new. It's an online telehealth service that links individuals with Suboxone specifically. Um, so you meet your doctor uh, over Zoom or on FaceTime. You never have to leave your house. Um, so this is part of a much bigger harm reduction model just to make services more accessible and safer. Okay, um, we can move on to the final slide. There's my references if you want to check them out, fact check. And uh, we'll see if anyone has any questions that they want answered. We'll take a minute and then Amber will take us out. Okay, so as we uh, finish up today, again, we thank you very much for your patience, uh, and we hope that you join us for our next webinar. So our next webinar is scheduled October 17th at 12 o'clock p.m. Uh, topic will be announced in a week or two, um, and again, we hope to see you there. Thanks so much for joining us. Amber. Amber.